Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm doing something a little different. I'm going to get a bit personal by telling you a bit about my time in an MLM or multi-level marketing business. This is stuff that I've been debating whether or not to cover for a while now, mostly because the story is such an embarrassing one for me. Looking back, not only do I hate that I was gullible enough to fall for it to begin with, but how long I stuck with it is just shameful. So. Let's get this out of the way now. I was an idiot. I know I was an idiot. Now let's see if I can stop being embarrassed about my idiocy for long enough to tell you what happened. This is going to be a bit of a narrative, because the MLM I joined was very different from what it has become today, and it went through many stages. And just as a disclaimer, what I am about to say is opinion. When I bring up any data, it is the data that is provided by the company itself. And the fact that I feel the need to protect myself with a disclaimer other than my normal fair use disclaimer should be a hint as to my feelings about how the company might handle potential criticism. The beginnings of the story go back to high school. When I was in high school, I got along well with one of the secretaries that worked there, and my wife and I kept in touch with her and her family after we left school. So when they called up one day explaining that they had a business idea that they wanted to run past us, it never crossed our minds that they might have been taking advantage of us. And I don't believe that they were. They were sincerely trying to help. And that's one of the fundamental ways in which MLMs operate. When someone you don't know calls you and tries to sell you something, you're generally skeptical right off the bat. I can't tell you how many times I've told that duck cleaning place to stop calling me in the last two weeks. But when a friend calls you up, they're your friend. Surely they're not taking advantage of you. You trust them. And in most cases, they aren't taking advantage, at least not intentionally. They honestly think it's a good idea, so the sincerity shows through, and anyone naive enough to not be aware of how MLMs operate can fall into this trap as a result. So we ended up joining up with them. It was an organization that at the time was known as Quickstar, which is a subsidiary of Amway. I didn't know what Amway was at the time, but I do remember that one of the main selling points for Quickstar was that it is not Amway. Another selling point was that no, it's not a pyramid scheme, with the qualification that in a pyramid scheme as defined by the FTC, there has to not be a product, but there are products. So see, we're not a pyramid scheme. Now if you sign up three of your friends and they sign up three of their friends, you know the drill. Really, at the end of the day, if someone is proactively explaining to you why the business opportunity they are trying to convince you to invest in is not a pyramid scheme, that's a pretty big red flag that it is one, even if it isn't technically a pyramid scheme as defined by the FTC. And of course, one of the other strategies for MLMs in general is to make the compensation plan as complicated as possible. I couldn't even begin to remember the details of the Quickstar plan, except perhaps for where the overlap is with what the group I was with eventually became. That is, income is determined by your total point value and the difference between your total point value and the point value of your highest point value downline. And if that made any sense to you at all, then you've probably been in an MLM. And that's just the beginning. How complicated the compensation plan is, is a feature, not a bug. That's part of the sales pitch for signing up for what most MLMs call their system, which is mostly just motivational talks and self-help books, but it's usually something that is promoted that will help you understand the ins and outs of the business. So we joined up, and we went to the seminars, and we bought the CDs, and the books. The books would be the same self-help books you could get at any bookstore, and usually they selected them to all make the same general points every time, so there wasn't much, if any, new information once you've read a few of them. The books that would come as part of the system were usually small pamphlet-type books, like The Parable of the Pipeline by Burke Hedges, which takes a few dozen pages to essentially say, wouldn't it be nice if money could come to you without you having to actively work for it? Do the work once and enjoy the reward for the rest of your life. That sort of thing. Most of these monthly books seem to be specifically authored with MLMs in mind, but were careful to avoid any specific details about exactly how one could create a pipeline income, thereby allowing all the different MLMs to use the book as evidence that joining up is a good idea, because MLMs will create the pipeline income. But they also had proper books for sale that didn't come as part of the monthly subscription. Things like Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, a book that, if followed perfectly, will result in you making an excellent first impression, followed by eventual annoyance at your presence as people get to know you. Great advice for salespeople, not so great for forming lasting relationships. 
Now, let's talk about these seminars for a bit, or rather, the culture surrounding them, because culture is a big part of an MLM. The idea is that who you surround yourself with will determine your results in life, and to prove this, they'll point out that rich people always seem to hang out with other rich people, and poor people always seem to hang out with other poor people, as if that somehow demonstrates that there is a causal link between hanging out with a rich person and becoming rich. Along these lines, there is an anecdote commonly recited about someone, I think it might have been Warren Buffett, who apparently once said that if he lost all of his money, he would get a job as a waiter in a restaurant that caters to wealthy customers, and would pay attention to what all the rich businessmen who came into the restaurant were saying, so that he could immerse himself in their culture and thereby learn how to get rich again. Now, I can tell you, as someone who has personally served celebrities, billionaires, and literal royalty, none of them discuss any important business where the service staff can hear it, and a nosy server is a server who doesn't last long in a fancy restaurant. Part of the job is knowing when to stay away from the table, and if there is any official business going on, that is a key indicator that they want to be left alone except for the basic order taking and quality checking. A server who hangs around listening in on their conversations is not appreciated in such situations. Which, if this were a true anecdote, it just serves to demonstrate how out of touch the fabulously wealthy are with ordinary working people. But that's beside the point. The point is, they encourage you to spend as much time around other people in the business as possible, and to encourage this, anyone who has any degree of success is treated as a minor celebrity. I remember when one of my upline, that is a person who is a few steps above me in the, um, triangle? hit a level known as Silver in Quickstar. Everyone made a huge deal about it. And while at this time the general income levels were not disclosed, some calculation showed that people who consistently hit that qualification for Silver would be making at least $1,000 a month. That's a big deal. I mean, it's not enough to quit your job over, but imagine having an extra $1,000 every month. You need to hang out with these people to learn what they learn. To that end, there are weekly show the plan meetings where you can invite people to come and there will be someone successful showing the plan to get those people in the business. But you should come even if you don't have a guest because you need to spend time with successful people that will be up there showing the plan, and then you can learn how to show the plan personally from watching them. Back to the seminars, that's where the really successful people come to speak, and they share their stories about how they overcame their obstacles to become successful people that they are today. And there's recognition at the seminars where they parade people who hit new levels or achievements across the stage to thunderous applause. So they have weekly meetings and monthly seminars designed specifically to keep people steeped in their culture. In the talks where they explain how to become successful, they always emphasize the importance of listening to the recorded talks as often as possible to keep yourself in the culture even when you're not at the meetings. They would talk about how 95% of the people control 5% of the wealth, and 5% of the people control 95% of the wealth, and the only real difference between what they dubbed 95%ers and 5%ers is how you think. So if you are constantly listening to 5%ers, then eventually you will become one. All you need to do is avoid 95%er stuff. So no more talk radio, and be careful what music you listen to, a lot of it has 95%er messages. In fact, if you can do without music, listen to the business CDs instead. Keep that 5% info playing as often as you can. We were even encouraged to sleep with the CD changer playing the talk so they could subliminally work their magic. I don't recall ever having actually done that, but I definitely remember people being applauded for doing things like that. We were also expected to personally sell seminar tickets to anyone that we signed up. They would even want you to call and bug people that hadn't been going to seminars for a while. They'd call it the 1% list. If there's even just a 1% chance that they'll buy a ticket, then do your best to sell them a ticket. And we learned from our upline that missing one single seminar is basically a business death sentence. You need that monthly boost in order to succeed. All the successful people go to every seminar. So after a few months in Quickstar, I started volunteering at the seminars. That's right, these seminars that they charge people $30 a ticket for run almost entirely on volunteer labor. I did sound. We had ticket takers, ushers, hosts, everything you need to put on a professional presentation. Everyone working with a great attention to detail, taking pride in their work and wanting to show what a good example they could be to the new people. With even people who weren't on the official volunteer list coming in early to help set up or staying late to help tear down. 
And just out of curiosity, I looked up the price of a hall rental for one of the locations that we actually use during my time volunteering. It's just under $200 per hour to rent the hall. We'd have it for about seven or so hours, so that's a total of $1,400. The capacity of the hall is 750 and we were usually at or close to capacity, so at $30 a ticket, which the volunteers also had to pay, by the way, adds up to $22,500. Let's just assume the AV equipment rental was about $2,000. I know it was actually a bit less than that, but I don't remember the exact number, so I'm estimating high. So that's just about $19,100 of profit for the company, which they split with the speakers through a profit sharing plan, which I don't have the details for because I never made it into that plan. But from hints that my upline dropped, I know it was a similar setup as the general income plan where the higher levels made more money. So at an event where they made $19,000 of profit, if they sent a nobody speaker who was at a fairly low level, that means more profit for the company and less for the speaker, all while running on volunteer labor. Had they paid the 20 or so people that ran the event just $15 an hour, they still would have made $17,000 in profit. Plenty to split between a company and a speaker, especially considering that there were hundreds of these events happening all over North America every month, all run by volunteers. But that's 95% thinking. We don't want to think in terms of wages. After all, if you can still figure out how much money you make per hour, then you're not really rich. Rich people don't think in terms of dollars per hour, so neither should you. Think of your time working at the seminars as an investment that will pay off. You get extra time around these wonderful people who are steeped in 5% thinking as well. It didn't come up often, but occasionally someone would ask why the people who ran the seminars didn't get paid, and this is the sort of answer they would get. Shortly after joining, the organization that we were a part of joined forces with another Quickstar organization known as TEAM, which was headed by Orrin Woodward and Chris Brady. These guys were trained engineers, and so it was suggested that they had developed a system in which anyone who applied themselves could be successful. New terminology started showing up. A power player was anyone who showed the plan 15 times a month, and I forget the exact numbers, but it's something like signing up people five deep in one leg and two deep in a side leg, legs being the different downlines that a distributor has, the walls of the um, triangle, so to speak. If you went power player, you got paraded across the stage and congratulated by everyone in your upline and downline. These were exciting times because apparently Oren and Chris were making it easier than ever for new people to make it big. This is when new names started showing up too. The merger was a long time ago, like 2005-2006 era, so I don't remember the big leader names that were being hyped before we merged with Team, but the new names are all still stuck in my head. Oren and Lori Woodward, Chris and Terry Brady, Bill and Jackie Lewis, Tim and Amy Marks, George and Jill Gazzardo. And you may have noticed something here. It's always a husband and wife couple at the big levels. In fact, the couple's names are so entwined that it's easier to remember the couple's names than the individual names. Jackie Lewis actually died while I was in the business, but I couldn't remember Bill Lewis' name until I put it together with her name. And that's on purpose. As an IBO, which was the quick star term independent business operator for all their members, we were explicitly told who to target and given a tiered list of demographics that were better to spend time on, and those that were more of a waste of time. Couples were top priority. And, oh man, if you could break into an ethnic group, that would be amazing. Tight-knit religious communities? Go get them! The ethnic and religious groups were targeted because it was seen as easy work. You get one in, and just that one couple will be your inroad to a bunch more people who trust that couple's judgment, and will therefore be much more willing and even excited to join up. And often, these ethnic communities that were targeted would be made up of people that were barely getting by. So you go in with a glimmer of hope and get them all throwing money at this business, and the first few that sign up actually start making a little bit of money from signing everyone else up. They share this information, and it perpetuates the business. Now, this aspect of it won't be heard on a CD or at a seminar. This came directly from my upline, who got it from their upline, who got it from their upline, etc. So it's not the official stance of the business, it's just how the business is done. It was also encouraged to sign people up who knew each other in a direct line with each other. So if you're going after your family, you might want to start a second leg, but everyone who knows each other should be in the same leg. This is to prevent what is called cross-lining, which is when people who aren't in each other's upline or downline start talking about business stuff. We were actually told not to associate closely with people that are cross-lined from us. Be pleasant with them, but don't go any deeper than the pleasantries. Because that can cause either you or them to end up discouraged. You don't know their business situation like their upline does, and they don't know yours. So even saying something innocuous could potentially torpedo their belief in the business and send them into 95% thinking that will harm them in the long run. So best to just say hi with a smile on your face and move on. 
After joining with Team, we started attending what were known as major functions. These were large events hosted in what was supposed to be a central location, and were usually in sports arenas of some kind, like the Dome in St. Louis. This is actually where some of the real physical danger of the business comes in. People were encouraged to do whatever it takes to get there. The opening talk was usually Chris Brady on Friday evening, joking about how many animals died by being hit by cars on the way to the convention, sometimes getting people who hit various animals to raise their hands or cheer to see which animal we killed the most of that time. And he'd also run through a list of places that people could come from and would get the whole stadium applauding whoever had driven the farthest. And there would be inspiring stories about people who stayed up driving all night, exhausted, to arrive at the convention, and then be excited through it but worn out, and then have to drive home, exhausted again, using the the excitement of the event to keep them awake. They would applaud people who drove through nasty weather to get there. There was a whatever it takes mentality about the whole thing. The worse your trouble in getting down there, the better story you'd have to tell when you got there. 300 some miles, five hour drive. I come from Collingwood, Ontario, Canada. It's a long drive, but it's well worth it. It's definitely worth it. Do I had a great you time. Can to get here. It's exciting. It's more than worth it. You gotta be here. It's worth anything you've gotta do to get here, 100%. So it might not come as a surprise to anyone that we lost two vehicles to accidents while driving home from these events. One when I was driving through a snowstorm that I should have stopped for and went off the road, and one where we got rear-ended in Maine on our way back from one of our first Canadian majors held out in New Brunswick. Did you know that insurance claims are a lot more of a pain in the ass when you have to rent a vehicle immediately just to get back home? Also, that's how I learned that in Maine, you are apparently automatically at fault if you get hit while turning, because even though we were rear-ended, we were still found to be at fault. Thankfully, our insurance company didn't just go by the police report, and they put it down as a no-fault collision. That's also when we got sued by the person that hit us for medical expenses, even though they didn't get out of their vehicle the entire time the police and ambulance were there, and they drove off apparently unscathed. We had to do a lot of finagling to not have to drive 10 hours up to Bangor to be deposed, doing it by video conference instead. So, after a few years as part of the team organization in Quickstar, Quickstar announced that it would be rebranding to Amway. Well, I guess re-rebranding, as Amway rebranded as Quickstar in 2001 to get away from the bad publicity. This triggered a bunch of lawsuits, as, remember, one of the sales pitches we were given is that no, this is not Amway. Turns out, even though we hadn't originally joined with Team, they used a similar sales pitch, so they sued to get everyone in their organization out of their non-compete clauses so they could roam free and find another MLM that would have them that isn't Amway. This played out as Orrin Woodward putting himself in the line of fire to protect all the little guys in his business, and after the lawsuits were over, there was this extra camaraderie between the people who had gone through all that, as if we were veterans of a horrendous battle or something. In fact, Orrin was very much revered during this time. He gave a talk telling his story of Spartacus, which ended in the crowd standing up and yelling, I am Spartacus. His next talk at that convention had to be cut short because it began with a full 20 minutes of thunderous applause. He was the hero, standing up for his principles in the face of having having to pay to fight the legal battle for all the distributors, making that sacrifice for no reason other than he believed it was the right thing to do. At this stage of the journey, they began looking for a new MLM company to partner with. An attractive prospect for any MLM. A top dog at a former MLM just got permission from the courts to ignore his non-compete agreement, and was going to poach thousands of IBOs from another MLM company. And he's looking to join you! Well, we ended up with one of those acai juice companies, specifically Monavi. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about Monavi because that isn't where they ended up permanently. The thing about taking thousands of distributors to a new MLM is that it gives you bargaining power. Their arrangement had them eventually put Monavi into just one aspect of their business, which they were transitioning to become a life coaching business, helping people in what they call the five F's of life faith, fitness, family, friends, and finance. So, Monavi became the fitness part drink your acai juice to stay healthy. So while I'm not going to go into the specifics, I will say this about anything using antioxidants as a marketing gimmick in general. Consuming antioxidants does not impact the amount of overall antioxidants in your system, and this is a good thing. Your body is in a homeostasis with antioxidant levels. Your body actually needs free radicals to operate properly. They are an important part of the immune system and can be used as signaling mechanisms between cells. 
So your body actually has a way of making its own endogenous antioxidants when it needs them. Now, there are some antioxidants that you do need to acquire through consumption, like vitamin C, but again, it's not a the more the merrier situation. In fact, too many exogenous antioxidants, that is, those that you take in through consumption, have been linked to cancer metastasis in mice. Solid tumors can send cancer cells through the blood, establishing new tumors through metastasis, but for some cancers, this is very inefficient, as free radicals in the bloodstream will kill the cancerous cells before they can establish a metastatic tumor. But in mice, an excess of exogenous antioxidants promoted metastasis. Now, of course, the companies promoting antioxidant supplements or high antioxidant juices won't tell you these things, but they will point out the preliminary science from the 90s when we first learned that free radicals play a role in the aging process. So clearly, if you take antioxidants to combat free radicals, you'll slow the aging process. Except all the science done over the last 25 years has pretty much shown that to be false. And now we're learning that too many exogenous antioxidants can potentially make cancer worse, which really sucks, as people with diseases like cancer are definitely targeted by companies promoting the health benefits of antioxidants. And of course, any personal testimony you hear is not officially sanctioned, but there are a lot that make some very bold claims. And this whole time, while we were learning of all the health superpowers of acai, we also found out that Amway had started selling oxygen water, and had some ridiculous demonstrations of people like bending over to try and touch their toes and then taking a sip of their water, and then bending over and being able to get significantly closer to touching their toes. And I'm going to pull down on your arm, you're going to try and prevent yourself from tipping over. Okay. Um. <laughs> Don't tip over. Maybe. Alright. So that's the balance one, alright? Okay. You know you're not supposed to be good yet. You've got to find the perfect one. Okay. Okay. Alright, drink some water. We would make fun of these presentations. Obviously, having a sip of water can't have an immediate effect like that. And if you stretch twice in a row, the second stretch will always go farther than the first. Like, why do you think stretching before a physical activity is a thing? It gets your body conditioned for it. Now here, drink this acai juice that'll unofficially stop you from getting the common cold. We were also encouraged, unofficially of course, to come up with our own testimonials as to the positive effects drinking the juice had had on our lives. I don't remember what my story was, but I can tell you two things about it for sure. First is, I wholeheartedly believed it. And secondly, it was bullshit. And this is pretty much how any MLM health company gets around the regulations about making health claims. These aren't claims, these are personal testimonials. The distributors aren't saying that their product did anything, they're just pointing out the fact that they started using the product, and then whatever health problem they were talking about went away. Any health claims are implied, not stated, and if any distributor actually makes a health claim, that's not on the parent company, that's on the distributor. And just as a fun fact, I looked up Monavie to see what they've been up to recently, and it turns out they defaulted on a $182 million loan and went into foreclosure in 2015, though the brand seems to have been picked up by Jeunesse Global, as you can still buy it from them. Back to Team, it was around this time that they changed their name from Team to Life Leadership, with their focus being on the five Fs that I mentioned earlier. Now, this is actually a bit of a unique angle for an MLM. Usually, an MLM has some product that they are pushing, like Mana V, but the real money that the higher-ups make is by selling the CDs and books to the distributors, and almost every MLM has some sort of system like that where you can start profit sharing on the CDs and books when you get to one of the higher levels. And often, this comes across as a dishonest tactic. You present the business as though it's an amazing income generator when really it's not the business itself, it's the business within the business of selling CDs and books, so it looks like it's taking advantage of these smaller distributors to line the pockets of the higher-ups. And this kind of tracks. The people on stage would tell you about the multiple mansions that they own, the extravagant vacations they take, the yachts that they have, living it up like millionaires. But when you do some digging into income, if you look at Quickstar, diamond-level distributors made an average of $146,000 per year. I mean, 
That's a good income, it'll certainly allow you to live a comfortable life, but it's not multiple mansions and yachts level income. But Diamond is what we were all told to shoot for. Once you get to Diamond, you'll be living the dream for the rest of your life. Well, turns out they make a lot more money than that by selling CDs and books to their distributors, so it ends up looking a bit suspicious. As a Diamond, I'll come speak at your volunteer-run seminar for a hefty speaker fee, and then the recording of that seminar gets put on a CD and sold to the distributors that weren't at the seminar, and I get the kickbacks from that as well. So Team, now Life, avoided the scandal by just making the CDs and books their actual business model, advertising themselves as essentially self-help experts and life coaches, and having the heads of the company all writing multiple books that could be included in their different systems for the different Fs. And a quick glance at their income disclosure statement from 2014 shows that this is, indeed, the much more lucrative business to be in, with Life Coach Plus ranks making an average of $137,441 per month. That's less than $10,000 shy of the average annual earnings of a Quickstar Diamond. But let's take a closer look at this income disclosure statement, shall we? Like, right off the bat, without digging in too much, we see some immediate issues. For instance, the average monthly income for all members was $62.97. Considering the minimum requirement to get a paycheck is to have $50 of personal volume, which is supposed to include customer sales, which to the company's credit, they actually do seem to take measures to ensure that at least $25 of this comes from legitimate customers rather than from distributors stocking their basements with products in order to buy their way into qualifying. But at the end of the day, the minimum required to purchase in order to make money seems to be about 50 bucks, which doesn't really sound like it adds up, but there are a bunch of situations where the point value of the product is cut in half because of this, that, or the other. It gets complicated in a hurry. But that means that the average member of Life Leadership in 2014 spent at least $50 in order to make $62 back. And from personal experience, I can tell you that sticking to the minimum $50 purchase for your own personal use is not recommended. That would cover maybe one of the five Fs. Ideally, they want you to sign up for all five, easily running your own personal spending, not including customer sales, into the hundreds of dollars per month. And then, looking at the actual numbers, 99.4% of members were at the student 15,000 level and lower. Averaging their averages, that means that 99% of the members make an average of less than $230 per month. Now, factor in $30 a month for seminars, and remember, they actively target couples, so that's actually $60 a month for seminars, and you are strongly pressured into attending the major conventions, both by the speakers at the seminars and by your upline, and major convention tickets ran for $125 each when I was there, so that's $250 per couple every three months, working out to $83 per month. So we're at $143 per month in expenses, not including travel expenses like time off work, meals, gas, and hotel hotels to make an average of $230 per month for 99% of the distributors. And you also have to buy this product for yourself in order to qualify to make anything, so that's at least $50 a month for that. So this puts a whole new perspective on the major conventions. When you're there, everyone's excited and there's an electricity in the air that's contagious and you just know that you'll be motivated to work extra hard on your business coming out of the majors. But looking back, that is thousands of people filling up the stadium. Best case scenario, 99% of them make an average of $40 per month in profit when we ignore travel expenses. Meanwhile, 0.6% of them bring in an average of $40,677 per month. Now, call me crazy, but if we go back to their 95% of people controlling 5% of the wealth versus the 5% of people controlling 95% of the wealth, it seems to me like that system gives you a better chance of making it big than the system that results in 99.4% of the people controlling 1.5% of the wealth with the remaining 0.6% of the people controlling 98.5% of the wealth. But they won't see this objection as a problem. Of course the lower levels make less money. It's about opportunity. How can we expect people to be responsible for the earnings of the distributor who doesn't put in the work to earn the money? Well, firstly, I'd like to direct your attention back to the fact that when I was there, the seminars were run by unpaid volunteers, who all work very hard to make sure they come off without a hitch. Even if you think that expecting wages is 95% thinking, when you stand there as part of the 0.6% relying on unpaid workers to produce materials that you will then sell to make some of that sweet, sweet 98.5% of the money, it would just be a matter of decency to reward the people whose work made that possible for you. But yeah, it's about opportunity. And in this opportunity, 50.76% of people who join up quit within their first year. Imagine working for any company that had 50% staff turnover every year. Do you picture that as a good place to work? 
Well, let me tell you, from personal experience, they're not good places to work. One restaurant I worked at was in a hotel, and after a year and a half there, I was the third most senior employee at the whole hotel. The only people who had been there longer than me were the accountant and one of the front desk clerks. And that is the only job I ever had where I even entertained the idea of quitting just by walking out in the middle of my shift. Call centers, places that are notoriously terrible to work, have about a 26% turnover rate. Now, of course, the leadership at Life will present this as though it's the people who just aren't willing to commit, but let me tell you, the bread and butter of these businesses are the people who are incredibly committed and stick around for years buying the products, attending the events, and hoping for a better life, but making little to no money. And you can actually kind of see this. There doesn't really seem to be a whole lot of upward mobility in the business, at least not at the higher levels. They make a big show of parading people across the stage for hitting new levels, and there are almost always long lines of people who qualified for something new, so it certainly looks like there is upward mobility. But after looking at what I can find of their materials online, it seems like the people at the top of the organization today are the same ones that were there when I was in it years ago. Well, with some notable exceptions, there seems to have been a schism where Tim and Amy Marks left life and are now with Bonvera, a health company that dabbles in everything from coffee to essential oils. And also, keep in mind, any business failures were kept very, very hushed. Claude and Lana Hamilton, who are basically the apex of the <clears throat> triangle in Canada, went through a period where their business shrank by some unknown amount. But the only reason I know that they shrank is because they made a huge deal about it when they requalified. Of course, they didn't present it publicly as requalification, but the people who had been in the business for a while knew what level they were always promoted as and could put two and two together when they had a big celebration for them hitting that level that they had, to the best of our knowledge, already been at for years. In fact, the video that I used where they were promoting the major functions? The footage for that video was shot at the function where Claude and Lana were recognized for that level. I was in the audience somewhere in that video. I saw a lot of faces of people that I knew in that video. Watching it now it was a really weird brand of nostalgia. And actually the only reason I remember this is because I remember that feeling of betrayal when I found out that Claude and Lana were essentially pretending to be at a level that they weren't actually at for who knows how long. Of course, at the time, I did my best not to show that feeling. We had to stay positive, after all. And that definitely wasn't the first thing or the last thing that felt fishy to me, but the fishy things up to that point had never been essentially an admission of long-term deception. Now, maybe they weren't being deceptive. Maybe the leg of the business that I was in just didn't get the memo, or something got miscommunicated at some point down the line. That's an easy enough thing to happen in this sort of business model. After all, you essentially rely on the telephone game to communicate anything specific to your upline or downline. The CDs and books are necessarily very general in nature, attempting to be applicable to any situation, but for specifics you need to turn directly to those in your business. But that's kind of the point. They couldn't make it publicly known that they had dropped in rank. They had to stay quiet on a need-to-know basis, because you have to focus on the positives, ignoring the negatives. Criticizing and focusing on negatives is what 95%ers do. You don't want to be a 95%er, do you? Speaking of criticism, have you noticed that the names that this organization has chosen for itself seem rather, well, bland? That's on purpose. You see, one of the things I learned about showing the plan is that Google is your enemy. We were encouraged to do everything we could to sign people up on the spot, because if they go home and look into it, they're likely to come across some criticism from 95%ers who obviously failed because they refused to personally grow and develop, but they couldn't accept responsibility so they're blaming the organization instead. That was a problem in Quickstar. A quick Google search for Quickstar takes you to all sorts of anti-MLM websites. So when our organization joined with Team, it became even easier. You didn't even mention Quickstar while showing the plan, talking about Team instead. And just go ahead and Google Team all you like, you won't find anything about the MLM with the word Team. Then they changed their name to Life. Same thing, search for Life, you won't find them. You need to add modifiers to the search. But I mean, most people know how to add modifiers to a search now, so what do you do about that? Well, all of the top leaders in life have their own blogs, sometimes multiple blogs for different topics, and they all link to each other's blogs. That gives them really good SEO, or search engine optimization. So if you search for Orrin Woodward, the entire first page of results are the life website, Orrin's blog, Orrin's social media, listings for some of his books, and stuff like that. Well, 
Anyone skeptical of the business will recognize these as being biased sources of information, so they may do the unthinkable and actually go to page two of the Google search results to see what else is there. And look, we have Claude Hamilton's blog, which has a bunch of articles tagged with Orrin Woodward as the keyword. But what's this here? Bill Lewis has a post called The Shocking Truth about Orrin Woodward. Surely that will be critical. Nope. Bill Lewis is one of the higher-ups in life, and that's his blog, where the shocking truth is that Orrin Woodward is a stand-up guy who just wants everyone to win big and make lots of money. You know, find out the truth about things. It had to be told. If you just search for life leadership, then yeah, you still get the blogs, but now you also get what appear to be critical sites. Sites with titles like Lies, Lies, Lies and the Life Leadership Scam, and Life Leadership Scam, Are You Nuts? Of course, the Lies, Lies, Lies article is all about how people are telling malicious lies about Orrin Woodward, making it their life purpose to deceive as many people as possible about their business opportunity. The Life Leadership Scam Are You Nuts site is no longer up, but using the Wayback Machine, we can see that it is about how nuts you must be if you think it's a scam, not saying it is a scam and you're nuts for joining. And this actually brings me to something that I found interesting while I was researching for this video. One of the things that they teach you in life is that persistence is one of the most important factors that can affect your success. Half the battle is just staying in the game. And yet, when I look through their blogs that appear to have been designed specifically to optimize SEO and to make it harder to find critical material, I find that most of them appear to be in an abandoned state. Chris Brady's blog hasn't seen a new post in two years. Orrin Woodward's blog did see a post in March of 2020, but the last post before that was in 2017. Claude Hamilton's blog also hasn't had an update since 2017. Their YouTube channels are in a similar state of disuse, and it was actually a bit gratifying for me when I realized that I have more subscribers than all of these guys combined. I mean, they can fill a stadium with people by promising them wealth beyond their wildest dreams, but they can't get them to click the subscribe button on YouTube. So they talk about persistence, and when telling their stories, they always play up how much free time they have now that they don't have traditional jobs. And yet, with all this free time, they can't find the time to be persistent in updating their blogs or YouTube pages. And as a modestly successful YouTuber, I can tell you that persistence definitely is one of the biggest factors in success. It wasn't until I started uploading regularly that my channel really started growing. So one of the little pieces of advice that they give that I actually agree with is one that they don't seem to be following themselves. Unless, of course, all these websites and YouTube channels are just more about clogging the search engines with material that is friendly to them, so once that was accomplished they were no longer necessary? Like, seriously, George Gazzardo posted one video four years ago with a title that seems to imply he's exposing Orrin Woodward and his Financial Matrix scam. The Financial Matrix referring to a book that Orrin wrote that is now commonly handed out to people that they're showing the plan to. That's all he has on his channel. And actually, the Financial Matrix was being pushed just before we stopped attending their events, so I never really learned what it was, but it seems to be a clever title designed to capitalize on their already set up blogs and social media sites to make it easier to make clickbait titles that look critical but aren't. So, as an outsider looking in, I see that Orrin Woodward wrote a book called The Financial Matrix. Now I see a YouTube video called The Truth About Orrin Woodward and The Financial Matrix Scam. If you haven't read the book and you don't know what The Financial Matrix is, this looks like they're going to be exposing Orrin Woodward's scam. But really it's just a video talking about how great their financial fitness program is. And as to the contents of these materials, they are so vague and generalized as to be functionally useless. In fact, their materials largely didn't change the entire time I was with them. Considering how many changes the company went through, the fact that they were still putting almost identical talks on CD and then selling them repeatedly as though they were something new, kind of demonstrates how their advice, when it actually was good advice, was generalized to the point of uselessness. Now, sure, they also had talks that were specific about what verbiage they were currently suggesting that you use while showing the plan, but all of the supposed in-depth personal development advice didn't seem to me to be anything other than typical self-help vague speak. And you can tell they keep it vague. In George Gazzardo's only video on YouTube, he talks about how much he learned from life's financial fitness program that protected him from the real estate crash in 2008. Even though he lost millions in property investments when the market crashed, he was still protected from it largely. The thing is, in 2008, life didn't exist. They were team back then, and they were affiliated with Quickstar until 2008. Life's financial fitness program didn't exist until a few years after team left Quickstar. Yet there he sits, talking about how the financial fitness program taught him how to protect himself financially, so that he was okay through this crash despite losing millions. When in 2008, the economic bubble popped, 
I don't know if you guys remember that. Now the good news is, because of the financial fitness program, it made me protected to the point where we were able to pay off every cent of that property, even though the valuation of it was a lot less after the bubble, we still covered our entire payments on that. This could mean one of two things. Either he is outright lying, or the materials haven't changed significantly enough to bother telling the story accurately. And as far as the future they envision is concerned, they talk a big game. I recall hearing a talk in which Chris Brady painted a picture of a future where the norm was that kids right out of high school would look at the different organizations that are a part of life and would apply to join the one that they thought was best for them. This talk actually generated quite a bit of cognitive dissonance for me, as with their tiered compensation plan, how are you supposed to make money once everyone has already signed up? The only way is to, every year, have more kids turn 18 and be legally allowed to join than in the previous years. That's not really a long-term sustainable business solution. Which brings me to my next point. Despite being run by two former engineers, Orrin Woodward and Chris Brady, the culture of the organization had a general disdain for higher education. That's part of the 95% system, you see. You go to school, get an education, get a job with that education, and then use consumer debt to keep up with the Joneses. They would put people like Sam Walton on pedestals, showing that you don't need a higher education to be successful. Sam Walton never did. Neither did Henry Ford, Bill Gates, Michael Dell, or Mark Zuckerberg. And they're all billionaires. Well, except for Henry Ford, he's kind of dead. So they must have done something right. Going to school just teaches you how to be an employee, and employees aren't the ones who get rich. This disdain for higher education played a major role in my dropping out of college. I was part of team while I was in college, and so I was listening to all of their materials talking about how college just teaches you to be an employee, where the business owners are the ones making the money, and some of the most successful ones never completed college. And so came one of the most embarrassing decisions I've ever made in my life. I dropped out of college with only one semester left to go on a two-year degree. And I was doing well enough that I still passed a couple of my classes even after I stopped attending. I justified this by saying it was a choice between working to pay my bills and attending class as the class schedule for the last semester severely interfered with the work schedule at my job, but I'm sure I could have managed if I had put more effort into school and work than in a pie-in-the-sky business opportunity. And, of course, the official advice I got from my upline was to stay in school, but this advice was decidedly less enthusiastic than all of the talks proclaiming college dropouts to be some of the most successful people alive. And I'm sure I'm not the only person who made such a terrible decision as a direct result of my involvement with them. It did work out okay for me in the end, but really, I can't know that for sure. Maybe I would be better off now had I continued with my education. That's something that will haunt me for the rest of my life. And yes, I did regularly ask my upline for advice. The idea was that the farther up the line you go, the more successful they must be, so before you make any life decisions, consult your upline so that they can give you the best advice. I remember basically asking Claude Hamilton's permission to buy my house, because they always talk about living debt-free, and one of the most powerful stories that the successful people tell is the story of that last mortgage payment. So I had the opportunity to buy a house, but I'd have to have a mortgage. Should I buy or continue to rent? The obvious answer is to take out a mortgage and buy. Mortgages are cheaper than rent after all. But I still felt obligated to ask before making my decision, because while the monthly payment would be less, it's a huge pile of debt. Now, I know, if there's anyone who is already deeply involved that sees this video, they will immediately think that it's just some bitter guy who's angry about how he wasn't able to become a successful businessman, and instead of self-reflecting, he's placing the blame on the MLM. And I know that my assurance that this is not the case will not actually do anything to change that opinion, and that actually makes me sad. I'm not upset that I didn't make it big in team. I'm happy with the life that I have now, and while being a pro YouTuber doesn't make me enough money to own multiple mansions and yachts and to have household staff and all the glitz and glam of the successful life member's life, it does provide me with the benefits that always seem to accompany their main selling points. I set my own hours, I work for myself, I decide how hard I work, there's no boss to report to, and I have chosen to do work that I am passionate about, so it's not drudgery going to work in the morning. I have not made this video out of bitterness and an attempt to do harm to the life business, as if I even could, to get back at them for my bad experiences or whatever. I've made this video because joining up with them led me to make decisions for myself that could have been incredibly harmful. I may have done alright for myself after dropping out of college, but that is not universally true. I made this video with the hope that I will prevent someone else from wasting years of their life with the false hope of a future filled with riches that, for 99% of people who join, will never materialize. 
You see, they will present their top guys and have them tell the story of when they were a lowly distributor just like you. And yes, that does happen. Sometimes people do join up and actually make it big. But it happens so infrequently as to be largely irrelevant. After all, if it actually happened regularly and consistently, it would be entirely obvious that these businesses are a good idea, and so everyone would sign up, and then the last few rounds of people to sign up would be completely screwed over. The business model is inherently flawed, and relies on a certain distributor failure rate in order to stop it from saturating the market to a point where the flaw becomes impossible to ignore. That's it for today. Part 2 will be myself and Telltale going through the bite model to determine whether or not the particular MLM I was in could be considered a cult. As of now, I don't know the results, but I have my suspicions based at least partly on the fact that at almost every major convention they reiterate several times that they are not, in fact, a cult. And is brainwashing really such a bad thing? Don't you want to clean the bad stuff out of your brain? The actual line, if I recall correctly, was, we don't do brainwashing, we do brain flushing. Flush the 95% thinking out of your brain. See you next time.